Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the final session of TRACO 2017. I'm Dr. Zia, one of the faculty coordinators of the course. I would like to pass on some information before we begin. Uh, the final exam will be posted by December 8th on the TRACO website, um, and the exam can be taken until January 12th, 2018. Uh, one question will be derived from each of the 26 lectures. If any of you have missed any of the lectures, they will be posted on the NIH videocast site for your review. I believe about 13 lectures have already been posted, uh, but they shall all be posted um, uh, for your review. Um, if you answer 70% or better of the questions correct, you pass the exam and will be forwarded a course evaluation. Uh, following successful completion of both of those components, a certificate of course uh, completion will be mailed to, uh, to you in late January. Um, <clears throat> our first lecture is by Dr. Pervez Hussain. Uh, he is an investigator in the Center for Cancer Research, Pancreatic Cancer Unit, Laboratory of Human Carcinogenesis. Unfortunately, he was not able to be here today, uh, so we will play his video cast from last year. His talk is entitled Pancreatic Cancer, Current Understanding and Future Challenges. What I am going to do today is to give you a brief overview about uh, pancreatic cancer. What are the current progress? What is our understanding? And what are the challenges to um, improve survival in this uh, most lethal malignancy in the world? So let me start with uh, this slide, which uh, uh, simply shows uh, that uh, it's the third leading cause of death uh, uh, in the cause of cancer death in the United States. Uh, you see here it's fourth, but when you combine both uh, men and women, uh, it comes to the third leading cause of uh, cancer deaths. The median survival is less than six months, estimated uh, 53,000 new cases and about 41,000 deaths will occur in 2016, and there is no effective treatment. So, so everything uh, 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 seems to be very uh, disturbing, and uh, uh, the most disturbing is that, according to the estimate, uh, it is going to be the second uh, leading cause of death due to cancer in the United States by 2030. So what are the risk factors for developing uh, pancreatic cancer? Uh, these are some of the risk factors, for example, smoking, long-standing diabetes, pancreatitis, obesity, and also non-O blood group O. And these are some of the cancer syndrome that are inherited syndrome, where you have uh, mutations in, uh, in different genes, and that enhances the risk of uh, pancreatic cancer, for example, hereditary pancreatitis, where you have mutation in the trypsinogen gene that enhances the risk to about uh, 50 fold. So in terms of treatment, we have not uh, made much advancement in terms of treatment. If you look here, about uh, uh, 20 years ago, gemcitabine, which is a chemotherapeutic drug, was approved over Fifluorouracil because it enhanced the survival only by uh, by about one month, and then about ten years later, arlotinib, which is a EGFR uh, inhibitor, was used in combination of gemcitabine, which enhanced the survival only by uh, about two weeks. And but the situation is so disparate, desperate that it was approved. By, uh, uh, by FDA, and um, it, it doesn't work in, uh, in advanced cases, and maybe there is a subset, a small subset that will respond to these combinations. And then in 2011, a combination of different chemotherapeutic drug, uh, uh, and the combination is called porphyrinox, that has the four different chemotherapeutic drugs that responded well, relatively speaking, in pancreatic cancer, as you can see here, it enhanced the survival in advanced cases, 11.1 months as compared to about six months by gemcitabine alone. But the problem was that it is highly toxic for majority of the patients. 
And then recently in 2013, uh, um, albumin bound nanoparticle uh, paclitaxel was uh, approved in combination of gemcitabine, which enhanced uh, the survival for few months as compared to just gemcitabine, but it is less toxic than falfurinox. And then most recently, last year, uh, nanoliposomal iron can and other two chemotherapeutic drugs were approved. And uh, this also enhanced the survival um, uh, by about a uh, couple of months when, uh, uh, when used uh, in combination. Uh, and it has less uh, toxicity. So as we know that uh, the dismal outcome is because of the late diagnosis. There is no early detection marker. And I will show you one or two slides about the situation. Um, in terms of early detection and very poor therapeutic response, as I just mentioned. But there are uh, about 18 to 20% of the patients that are detected early. And they are detected early because they are um, uh, examined for something else, but the physician finds that, okay, you have uh, the earliest stage of pancreatic cancer. And these earliest stage pancreatic cancer patients can qualify for surgical resection. So you will imagine that, okay, stage one, it is resected, everything is fine, but still the median survival, even in these 18 to 20% of the patients, is less than two years. And so, so majority of the patients, about 80% of the patients, show recurrence of the disease within two years. But there is a small minority of patients, resected patients, that do survive for survive for five years. So are there difference among these early stage patients? Are there molecular differences? There are several clinical prognostic factors, for example, stage, grade, lymph node spread, and resection margin at the time of resection that suggest the survival, good or bad survival in these cases. However, we do see variable outcomes. Sometimes you see stage one, resection margin zero, and the patient die within six months. But in some cases, the same stage, same grade, same resection margin status, they survive for two years, three years, four years, or five years. So one of the hypotheses is that there are molecular differences in tumors that actually determine patient outcome. So how we can improve survival in pancreatic cancer? We know that you know we don't have uh, for uh, early detection marker, response is, uh, is poor. So we need effective therapy. And for effective therapy, we need novel molecular targets that can be effectively targeted. And then molecular subtypes, that molecular makeup of the tumors that will respond to a specific drug. And treatment selection can be done based on the molecular subtype. And then drug delivery, so especially, and I will uh, talk a little bit more about the drug delivery in pancreatic cancer. It's very difficult because the tumor, it's surrounded by a huge stroma and it's kind of highly protected and it's also hypovascular, means it's not vascularized well. So when you give a treatment, the treatment is not reaching the tumor because the the less number of uh, blood vessels, and also blood vessels are collapsed. So there are some experiments that have been done to, uh, to, to reduce those interstitial pressure on the blood vessels, and that has improved drug delivery and also survival, which I will talk in a minute. And also we need early detection markers, the biomarkers that can in fact detect precancerous lesions. Because once the cancer is in stage one or, or a stage two, it's already too late as I discussed earlier. So we need to have biomarkers that can be, a, uh, uh, that can identify uh, patients when they have precancerous lesions. So for all these, we need to understand tumor biology that will involve both genetics, epigenetics, tumor stromal interaction, metabolic reprogramming, and transcriptional dysregulations. So let's talk about 
in one or two slides the biology of pancreatic cancer. So it is developed by well-defined precursor lesions, which are called pancreatic intraepithelial neoplastic lesions. This is the normal uh, uh, duct, pancreatic duct here, and this is the uh, pancreatic intraepithelial neoplastic lesion one. You can see here some dysplastic changes going on. This is grade two, and this is tannin three, which is almost carcinoma in C2, and then it penetrates the basement membrane and it forms uh, 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 this glandular-like structure, which is called pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. And PDAC, or pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, is the most common form of pancreatic cancer. It's about more than 90%, 90 to 95%. And there are several well-defined genetic alterations that occurs here, like uh, telomere shortening, Keras mutation, is found in about uh, 90 to 95% of the patients. Then P16 alteration, both by, by uh, epigenetic alterations and mutations. And also C53 and SMAD4 mutation that are found in about 50% of all the pancreatic cancer. As I mentioned, this is just a, a, a section of the pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, which shows huge stroma, these are the glands, pancreatic tumor glands, and then here it shows that there is a, a strong uh, interaction between tumor and stromal cells, and they support each other. So as I mentioned, there is a lack of any marker that, uh, that can detect this cancer early on. There is only one marker that is clinically used these days. This is carbohydrate antigen 19-9. So anything in the serum, if it is more than 37 units per ml, that is a marker of pancreatic cancer. But the problem is that sensitivity is only 80% and a specificity is also not that good. So this is not a very good marker. And it's also not just a specific for pancreatic cancer. And also, if you compare the malignant versus the benign pancreatic disease, both the sensitivity and specificity is very low in this cancer. So one study that was published last year by Ragu Kalori's lab, what they have found in the circulating exosomes, if they are glyco, glypican positive, glypican is a proteoglycan, and they found that majority of the pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, they have circulating um, exosomes that have, uh, 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 that are glypokine positive, and this is the discovery cohort, and then they validated their findings here. This is healthy donor, uh, benign pancreatic disease. This is, this is uh, uh, precancerous pancreatic lesions and pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. And as you can see here, they are showing 100% specificity and 100% sensitivity. So if this is validated later on in a larger cohort of pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, then this will be a very good marker for early detection. They also showed that if you have uh, a, a lower level of uh, circulating exons with, uh, uh, which are glypican positive, then you have better survival as compared to the one that has uh, higher uh, uh, circulating exosome that are glycosome that are glypican positive, but they do not find that in the CA19-9. So again, they are saying that it is also a prognostic uh, marker in the pancreatic cancer patients uh, that uh, how well they are going to do. I mentioned a little bit about uh, the molecular makeup, uh, uh, that are there different molecular subtypes of the pancreatic cancer that respond differently to treatment, and they have different uh, prognosis. And uh, these are some of the examples. So one of the studies 
by Bert Vogelstein lab at uh, Johns Hopkins. What they did, they uh, uh, did the genomic analysis of only 27 uh, tumor sample. Uh, this study was done a uh, long time ago, 2008. And what they found that each tumor had at least 68 or 70 different genetic alterations. And these all genetic alteration corresponded with 12 core signaling pathway that was altered. But at the same time, what they also found that if you compare two tumors, there were different genes that were altered in each of these different pathways. So the uh, summary of this slide is that it's highly heterogeneous tumor. And we see a lot of heterogeneity, intertumor heterogeneity in this cancer. And then in 2011, another uh, um, study was published in which they, they uh, did the gene expression analysis of pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. And based on the gene expression, they divided these into three different subtypes. And one of the subtypes, which is here, quasi-mesenchymal subtype, had the poorest survival among all these uh, pancreatic cancer. On the same line, uh, in 2015, uh, there was a um, study where they, uh, they analyzed the variation in chromosomal structure, and they identified four different uh, pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma subtype, stable, scattered, unstable, and locally rearranged based on the, on the degree of chromosomal alterations. And the unstable type was the one where the most um, chromosomal variation occurred. And this was also associated, this subtype, was with the alterations in the DNA repair pathway. And the patients which represented unstable subtype responded very well to the platinum therapy. And they correlated that because they have uh, uh, um, uh, alterations in that DNA repair mechanism. That's why they, they responded very well to the platinum drug. So that's how uh, these are providing proof of concepts that the patients, for example, a stage one or a stage two patients, they should not be treated that they all are same patients, but they, sh they can be subgrouped based on their genetic uh, uh, molecular makeup and select and stratify those patients that will respond differently to a, a specific drug. And then, again, last year, there was another uh, study in which they, they virtually micro-dissected using a, a computer algorithm where they separated the epithelial tumor cells gene expression and the stromal gene expression, and based on the stromal gene expression. So they divided in the, into the activated stroma and the inactivated and the normal stroma. And what they found, that no matter what the genetic makeup of the tumor is, if the stromal tissue shows the, the activated uh, uh, stromal gene expression, then the survival was poor. So what they were trying to say, that the studies where we take out the patient tumor and do the xenograft studies in the mice may not represent the actual uh, tumor of the patients because uh, if the stromal uh, gene expressions are active stroma, then it will respond differently uh, to the treatment. And again, recently in 2016, so you can see this is a, a highly active area to find out the different subtypes in in the pancreatic uh, tumors, tumors so that they can improve uh, 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 treatment. So this is the, the largest study, almost 500 patients, and, uh, and they, they described four different subtypes, and they were overlapping with the previous uh, uh, um, uh, studies uh, describing different subtypes. And then based on the, on the metabolism um, and, uh, and the metabolic activations. This was again divided into slow proliferating type, 
glycolytic and lysogen. And this is the last study on the, on the uh, 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 molecular subgroups of uh, pancreatic cancer. So talking about the difference in metabolic programming or metabolic characteristics of pancreatic tumors, what studies have found that, that uh, pancreatic tumor cells, they reprogram their metabolic pathway. And this is a highly complex slide, but I would just, just highlight three points. And one is that you have increased glycolysis here. You also have, see the glycolysis intermediates that goes into the non-oxidative segment of the uh, 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 phosphate pathway here. And there is a alternate glutamine metabolism here, which is unique to the pancreatic cancer, where glutamate is, is converted to aspartate, catalyzed by GOT2. And this aspartate is, is shunted out to the cytoplasm and, and gives pyruvate through several sequential steps. And during this process, NADPH that is produced is used for the redox balance instead of the NADPH that is used by the pentose uh, phosphate pathway here. So this is not active here, rather it has an alternate metabolism. So these are the three points, increased glycolysis, alternate glutamine metabolism, and the activation of the non-oxidative pathways. These are the three important points. And many of these enzymes that are catalyzing these reactions are modulated by KERAS. So if you remember, about 95% of the pancreatic tumors have KERAS mutations. And then recently, last uh, week, no, uh, in August, couple of months ago, what they found is that, as I mentioned, that stroma is very uh, helpful for pancreatic tumors. And one of the important components in the stroma is the pancreatic stellate cells. And these stellate cells, in fact, produce LNA, and it supports uh, uh, cancer cells. It fuels TCA cycles, supports lipid uh, biosynthesis and shunts glucose to serine and glycine biosynthesis. So this is the latest concept in uh, in uh, um, in pancreatic cancer uh, metabolic rewiring, where the pancreatic stellate cells in the stroma can support the and there is a positive feedback loop. What we don't know that what makes tumor cells undergo autophagy to produce, uh, 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 to activate uh, um, um, pancreatic stellate cells to produce alanine. So let's talk a little bit more about stroma because these are, are some of the, of the latest progress that have been made in pancreatic cancer. So what has been found, this is also a complex slide, but I will make it highly simple, and uh, you see here the environment is immune suppressive. So CD8 positive T cells is inhibited by Prx cells, MDHC, and tumor-associated macrophages. That is the one part. Pancreatic stellate cells, which I just uh, uh, mentioned, that uh, enhances the, uh, the tumor stroma, which is called desmoplastic reactions. And then, as I mentioned briefly, that due to the highly uh, uh, desmoplastic stroma, you have accumulation of hyaluronic acid that increases the interstitial fluid pressure on the, on the blood vessels, and that uh, inhibits the drug flow to the tumor. Okay. So how we can target a stroma uh, uh, to, to enhance drug delivery? So there are two studies that have been done, and this is the mouse model that have been used in this study. This mouse model has pancreas-specific um, activation of KERAS and inactivation of T53, and they developed pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, which exactly 
recapitulates the development and progression of pancreatic cancer in human. So they use these models. And what they found is that if they inhibit the stroma through inhibition of hedgehog signaling pathway, then uh, they increase the survival in this mice with pancreatic cancer, and they also decrease the liver metastasis. Then there was another study here where uh, they, uh, they reduce the hyaluronic acid deposition in the stroma by using hyaluronidase, and that reduce the interstitial pressure, and, and the blood vessels that were, were compressed got relaxed, and there were more drug uh, uh, delivery in the tumors, and they found that by doing this, they enhanced survival, and they also reduced metastasis. So this, this uh, uh, approach is currently under phase two clinical trial, and they have some, uh, some positive uh, responses. But there are two other studies that contradicts these findings by saying that removing a stroma or inhibiting a stroma may not always be beneficial. So in these two studies, that were published back to back in cancer cells. What they shown using a genetically engineered mouse model, that if you inhibit sonic hedgehog and reduce the stroma, in fact, uh, 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 the survival goes down. So reduce survival here, and then you also see increased metastasis, and you see increased the precancerous lesions. Then in another study on the same line, published in the same journal, back to back, they showed the same thing, that myofibroblast depletion enhanced pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. So myofibroblasts are the stromal cells, cells in the desmoplastic stroma, and when you inhibit those myofibroblasts, you see increase um, in, the, in the tumor agenicity, and you also see uh, um, increase, uh, decreased survival. So based on these uh, contradictory studies, I think more work needs to be done and more uh, uh, to identify that which patient will respond better by anti-stromal therapy. So you have to reprogram a stroma in order to, uh, uh, to enhance uh, 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 sensitivity to, to the drugs. So tumor stromal interaction is a complex and therapeutic approaches. Targeting a stroma needs caution and may require new molecular taxonomy in pancreatic cancer. So let's talk about one of the glycoprotein uh, that is highly expressed on different tumor uh, types. And this is mesothelin. This is a glycoprotein that was discovered right here at NCI in Ira Pastan's uh, lab. And, uh, and this was targeted by using immunotoxin in mesothelioma, which very uh, 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 successfully, with very good results. So, so this slide is just to show you that pancreatic cancer, along with other cancers, also express a large amount of uh, mesothelin. So this is a good target. So what? Sunil Hingorani and groups did, which uh, they, re they re-engineered uh, T cells here uh, to target mesothelin. And they did uh, this, um, and this worked very well by penetrating through the, the very dense stroma and also immune suppressive environment. And in fact, they lysed tumor cells by binding to, to mesothelin and also, also enhanced survival in these mice. So this is also going to go in the clinical trial, and let's hope that, uh, that something uh, 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 comes up, uh, up that will be beneficial to the patient. This is the, the highly uh, advanced model that has been developed recently, just in last one year, which is called organoid model, and David Tuveson, uh, at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory uh, developed this model, and this is going to be the most important preclinical tool, both to understand individual tumor biology and also 
uh, um, um, identify uh, uh, drug targets and uh, test different novel targets. So what happens that from the patient, they can take small part of the, of the tumors and they can develop in outside in the culture, 3D culture, exactly the same uh, architecture of tumor as you see in the patient. And this can be frozen. And after that, if you transplant that in a mouse model orthotopically, it starts with the development of precancerous lesions and going to the, to the advanced cancer. So this is one of the latest model. I just wanted to, uh, 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 to tell you about this. How much time do we have, Terry? About three minutes left. Okay, great. So, so I will take 10 more minutes. And, uh, and uh, uh, please let me know if any of these points, what I'm trying to make is not clear, so I can stop and then explain to you. Uh, inflammation is an important uh, uh, component in pancreatic cancer development and progression. Chronic pancreatitis, as I mentioned, enhances the risk of pancreatic cancer. There are several uh, oncogenic pathways that are constitutively active, for example, NF-kappa B signaling, desmoplastic stroma, huge stroma, highly active inflammatory cells, and inflammatory cytokines, COX-2, and NOS2, these are the two uh, um, enzymes that catalyzes different reactions that produces reactive species. So if you look at the schematics of normal pancreatic intraepithelial neoplastic lesions, precursor lesions, and PDAC, you see a stepwise accumulation of inflammatory changes here, here that accumulates over uh, different stages. There are also uh, evidence which shows that, as I mentioned, KRAS mutation is, uh, is very important. It activates KRAS, and more than 95% of the patient have KRAS mutation, but all the mutated KRAS is not tumorigenic. So what has been shown that mutated KRAS has to reach a pathological level of activation, and that is, is provided by these reactive species that are generated during chronic inflammation, just an example. So one cytokine that we are working in my lab. So I will uh, give you, you uh, uh, a brief overview with four or five slides that what we are doing in our lab here at NCI about uh, pancreatic cancer. And we are interested in one of the cytokines that is called macrophage migration inhibitory factor. It's a pro-inflammatory cytokine expressed in epithelial and inflammatory cells. It was described as regulator of immune response, increased expression in tumors. It, it also activates oncogenic signaling pathways, NF-kappa B, AKP, ARK1, 2, enhances some of the enzymes which I just mentioned. It also antagonizes P53, RB, 2F pathways, and based on these and other functions, it is described as a link between inflammation and cancer. So we tested a simple hypothesis. MIF contributes to pancreatic cancer progression and predicts disease outcome. These are the tumor and adjacent non-tumor tissue. You see increased expression of MIF in the tumors. These are the normal pancreatic duct. When you do the survival analysis, this is the Kaplan-Meier analysis. And if you group the patients in two groups based on the MIF expression level as high and low based uh, using median value as the cutoff, then you see that the high MIF expressing uh, tumor uh, 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 patient have poorer survival than those patients where tumor expression is, uh, is relatively lower. And this can be validated in several different groups of patients or the cohorts and also the publicly available data sets. So this simply shows the association, what MIF actually does. So we did an in vivo experiment in which you overexpress MIF and transplant those cells in the, in the tumors. You see that MIF expression tumors was larger and also more metastasis here. When you look at the tumors histology, they are completely different. The control tumors showed 
highly differentiated or uh, uh, a mod moderately differentiated or well differentiated. But the MIF expressing tumors are poorly differentiated that are more aggressive. When you look at the gene expression analysis between these two tumors, you see um, uh, a, a change in the global gene expression profile. And some of these genes, genes represent that uh, 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 the EMT pathways and MIF over expressing tumors showed expression of EMT marker genes. Then in this paper, uh, uh, recently in Nature Cell Biology, David Leiden's group showed that in the pancreatic cancer patients, if the circulating exosomes have higher, micro, higher macrophage inhibitory factor level, then they are more prone to metastasis. As I mentioned earlier in my talk, that pancreatic cancer patient, early stage patient, some metastasize faster, some don't. So maybe the, the those patients who have high MIF expression, they are at increased risk of liver metastasis. So we wanted to see that what is the difference between the tumors who are expressing high MIF level and those that are low MIF level. So we asked two questions. What are the molecular distinctions between these two group of tumors? And what are the mechanistic and functional role of MIF in tumor progression? So a highly talented postdoc in my lab did the integrative transcriptomic analysis in which he analyzed these two group of tumors by uh, uh, mRNA and microRNA array. And what uh, 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 he tested the hypothesis that MIF regulates microRNA associated with tumor progression and disease aggressiveness. And he found several differentially expressed microRNA between these two groups. Some of them were also associated with survival. He validated these data in multiple cohorts of pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. And, and what we found at the end that MIF enhanced a microRNA, MIR301B, and MIR301B B targeted one of the potential tumor inhibitory gene, NR3C2, which has not been described in pancreatic cancer before. And this NR3C2 was inhibiting EMT. So if you have increased MIF, it enhances MIR301B, and 301B inhibits NR3C2, then there will be more EMT, and, and there will be more progression and metastasis. So the hypothesis is now that MIF NR3C2 signaling is a potential therapeutic target in pancreatic cancer. So we went further, and we used the same model, and we deleted the MIF from this KPC mouse model, which I earlier described. And what we found that when you remove MIF genetically from these mice, it significantly enhanced survival, you can see here. And, and it also decreases metastasis in these mice. And then we did some, uh, some molecular studies and you found that MIF deleted uh, 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 mice. They had increased the e cadherin decreased ZEV1, Vementin, and n cadherin and these are EMT marker, this is uh, Western blot analysis. And then again, uh, you see reduced microRNA 301B expression in MIF deficient KPC mice and increased the NR3C2 expression. Just to, to show that what we are showing, finding in the, in the human tumors, the same uh, uh, we are finding also in the disease model. So now it's a potential target. So, so how we can go further? The further is that uh, now use the MIF specific inhibitor because you can delete genes in the patient. So you have to use these inhibitors once the mice develop this tumor. So that's what we are, we are doing. There are several ways. You can use a small molecule MIF antagonist, which we are using. We are also so using anti-MIF antibodies, which is uh, in, in clinical trial for, for other cancers. And uh, in summary, from, from this last uh, experiment which I showed you, is that a higher MIF expression is associated with poorer outcome. MIF enhances growth and metastasis of tumor xenografts in mice. MIF-driven signaling inhibits NR3C2, which is an anti, uh, um, uh, it's a tumor suppressive, potential tumor suppressive gene. 
by upregulating near CO1B. And uh, NR3C2 is a negative regulator of EMT. MIP deficiency increased survival and reduced metastasis. Therefore, MIF near 301B NR3C2 signaling is a potential therapeutic target. So I would like to end with this slide, which I showed right in the beginning, that, that in order to achieve early detection and effective therapy, we need to understand extensively pancreatic tumor biology. And in last uh, six to seven years, there have been been enormous amount of uh, effort that uh, that are made in understanding pancreatic tumor biology, and now we are at a point that we have several leaps that can be be taken into the preclinical and uh, and clinical setting. So I will stop here and take your question if you have any. Thank you very much for your attention at 5:30. Yes, it does. So, so what happens that uh, that MIF uh, enhances uh, 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 the the uh, uh, the level of MDHC and the level of T regulatory cells in the tumors. So, when we check the the tumors, MIF uh, expressing and control tumors, we found that when you remove MIF, you have less of those immune suppressive. Great, thank you very much, thanks. So our next speaker uh, is Dr. Marina Dobrovolskaya. She is a senior principal investigator and head of the immunology section at the Nanotechnology Characterization Laboratory, Lidos Biomedical in Frederick, Maryland. She leads a team of scientists and technicians conducting preclinical studies to monitor adverse effects of nanoparticles to the immune system, both in vitro and in vivo. Her team strives to improve the understanding of mechanisms of nanoparticles, uh, nanoparticle immunotoxicity. She is a part of several nanomedicine working groups and has published more than 45 peer-reviewed uh, journal articles on this topic. Her talk is entitled, Nanotechnology for Cancer Therapy, Benefits, Concerns, and Effects of the Immune System. And uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so what I will talk today about the uh, application of nanotechnology for cancer therapy, uh, I will try to give a very general overview of the field uh, to give you an idea of what nanotechnology can do for cancer therapy. We'll talk about uh, benefits of the technology and uh, some concerns. And because my area of expertise is in uh, immune, immune, immune system and immunotoxicity, all of the examples that I will be using are from the field of uh, nanoparticle interaction with the immune system. This is the outline of my presentation. And for those who are watching us online, uh, I will try to use uh, the laser pointer here on the screen. So you, uh, you, you can see this red dot moving. So we'll talk about the nanotechnology definitions. We'll talk about nanoparticles in da daily life. I will give you some examples. We'll talk about use of uh, nanoparticles in medical applications, then specifically focus on uh, cancer diagnosis and therapy and um, uh, if, uh, review the effects on the immune system. So what is nanotechnology and what are the nanoparticles? There is uh, no uh, universal definition. One of the very commonly used definition is from the National Nanotechnology Initiative that defines nanoparticles as objects with a size and at least one dimension between one and 100 nanometers. But as you, you will see later from my presentation, Many of the nanoparticle formulations that are approved for the clinical use are a little bit larger. So the uh, average size of um, these materials that are currently used in the clinic to treat uh, cancer and then also other uh, you know, diseases is uh, 350 nanometers and uh, below. And for this reason, uh, United States Food and Drug Administration came up with a different definition where they say that uh, they will consider a material uh, with a size up to one micrometer if that size brings the size-related property, which is the main you know, the property of the nanotechnology. So there are a lot of nanoparticles in daily life. Here you see uh, some of the products that are used on the market. 
Uh, they are manufactured by more than 800 uh, uh, companies in many countries around the world, uh, include uh, clothing, wood, uh, wound dressing, machine liners, sunglasses, uh, sporting equipment. Uh, you may go online and Google and you may find a lot of the silver nanoparticles, for example, or gold nanoparticles in this uh, health stores online that uh, uh, sell them for improving mental health and uh, immunity and everything else. Um, but then we develop these materials for clinical applications. We have to go through very rigorous characterization of efficacy and the safety. So these are other examples of the nanoparticles in daily life. They include uh, metal oxides such as uh, titanium and zinc oxide in sunscreens. So you can differentiate between the nanotechnology-based sunscreens and the regular sunscreen by the color. If you apply sunscreen on the skin and you see white marks, it's not nano. And if you apply sunscreen on the skin and there is no white marks, then they contain these nano-sized materials. Interestingly, uh, a lot of the co uh, cosmetics uh, companies like L'Oreal include uh, nanoparticles in the form of these liposomes and emulsions, the lipid-based vesicles in their creams, because these materials improve the penetration uh, of whatever is in these lipids in, uh, in the skin. Uh, carbon nanotubes, on the other hand, are very durable, and they are used as a structural materials. To my knowledge, there is no carbon nanotube-based nanomedicine uh, approved for the clinical use. Most of these materials are used in industrial applications. However, in basic research, if you search PubMed, you will find a lot of the applications where even nanotubes and the graphene uh, particles are used for delivery of the drugs uh, for cancer uh, therapy. Uh, here, I would like to give you some idea of the distribution of the nanoparticles uh, in current drug products. For this, I use this paper uh, recently published in Nature Nanotechnology by Catherine Tyner and uh, her colleagues. If you look in the top row of these pie charts, then you will see the, uh, uh, what, is, what type of the nanomaterials are used for drug delivery. And you see this large piece, uh, uh, they uh, separated it by the... Uh, uh, you know, uh, by the years, you will see that majority of these applications are uh, liposomes, uh, followed by nanocrystals, followed by emulsions and uh, iron uh, polymer complexes and other types of the materials. If we look at the indication, the majority of the indication is cancer, followed by uh, inflammatory uh, diseases, followed by uh, infections and anemia treatment. And finally, if we look at the route of administration, that majority of the material, uh, 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 the nanomaterials that are used uh, in drug products are intended for systemic administration via intravenous route. The next, uh, second popular route is uh, oral route. Uh, nanoparticles are used in uh, cancer therapy all you know, the main reason in even for the use of nanoparticles in other types of therapies is because uh, nanomaterials can improve solubility of hydrophobic drugs. A lot of the small molecule drugs are insoluble, and then we use them for basic research. We can use DMSO to solubilize, but we cannot in, uh, inject DMSO into patients. Uh, nanoparticles can help solve this uh, problem and over, uh, overcome uh, other uh, barriers. They also over this multifunctional capability. This is a schematic example from uh, Dr. McNeil's review that shows you the multifunctional nanoparticle, where basically you have a core particle, and then it has a drug attached to the particle, it has polyethylene glycol on the surface, it has an imaging agent and a targeting moiety. So there are a variety of uh, of uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients, which in theory one can put on the surface of the same particle and uh, co-deliver these materials uh, into the target cells. Uh, nanoparticles are used for robotic tasks, such as in sensing computation, uh, triggered responses, and in the field of cancer therapy, tumor targeting is uh, one of the attracting uh, reasons for using nanotechnology. 
uh, one of the benefits of uh, using nanoparticles is the reduced toxicity. And on this slide, I will show you two examples, one from the small molecule drug and another one uh, uh, from the drugs which belong to the category of therapeutic proteins. And what I do, I will compare traditional formulation of this drug with the nanotechnology formulation. So small molecule. In, uh, all of you are familiar with this drug, uh, doxorubicin, which is used for cancer therapy. The nanotechnology form formulation of this drug is known as doxil, or pegylated liposomal doxorubicin. Here we have doxorubicin inside of the uh, liposome that also has polyethylene glycol on the surface to improve circulation time and the stealthness of, of this uh, particle. So the DIC and PCA stand for disseminated intravascular coagulation and procoagulant activity respectively. So these two types of the immunotoxicities are also known as consumptive coagulopathy. Uh, if uh, drug or some cancer cells may induce uh, DIC uh, 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 that uh, induces leukocytes to express this phospholipid protein complex on the surface that uh, serves as a platform for uh, assembly of the blood coagulation factors that trigger blood coagulation. And because of this massive coagulation, uh, later on in the course of this uh, toxicity, uh, patients are dying from bleeding because of the massive consumption of coagulation factor. So basically, these types of toxicity changes the uh, hemostasis in the, uh, uh, in the blood. So this type of toxicity is very common uh, for uh, doxorubicin. In fact, uh, many, especially in the acute myeloid leukemia patients in the blood cancers, and this drug is used, uh, uh, the patients uh, often have to uh, be withdrawn from this uh, drug because of the uh, induction of the DIC. None of such reports uh, are available with uh, liposomal formulation of doxorubicin. In the area of therapeutic protein, I would like to use example of the tumor necrosis factor alpha. It's a cytokine, it's a recombinant protein that was tested in clinical trials in the uh, uh, 80s, and it failed uh, because of the systemic inflammatory response. However, uh, there is a small biotechnology company uh, here in Maryland, uh, Site Immune Sciences. So what Site Immune Sciences team did, they put tumor necrosis factor on the surface of the pegylated colloidal gold. And now this concept successfully passed phase uh, one clinical trials without affecting, without inducing systemic uh, uh, inflammation, systemic inflammatory responses. Um, very popular area in the cancer therapy these days is immunotherapy, right? We are hearing uh, this uh, fascinating reports about the success of the immunotherapies, but nanoparticles have um, a lot of benefits. Some particles may be used for specific delivery of immunotherapeutics, but in this uh, uh, case, I would like to share with you some of these hidden and yet unexplained, unknown mechanistically effects from the nanoparticle. So remember I told you about doxyl. It's a pegylated liposomal doxorubicin. Uh, if the study is conducted in athymic mice, then uh, in, in this case the UCT26 uh, uh, colon carcinoma model, this is a study recently published by uh, Medimmune, and you see there is no difference uh, between the uh, doxorubicin and doxyl at the dose of 5 milligram per kilogram and even untreated mice. So the tumors continue to grow. However, if they conduct the same study in the same cancer model and use the same uh, doses of the drug in the immunocompetent animals, in the bulb C animals, then you see that uh, in the doxyl treatment, they observe delay in the tumor growth. So eventually tumors grow, but uh, there is a delay in the tumor growth. More other. So what they did, they now take doxyl and they combine it with uh, known uh, immunotherapeutics with anti-PD-1, anti-CTLA-4, and uh, OX-40 ligand. And you see then uh, in the combination with anti-PD-1, they, uh, out of 12 animals, 11 achieved complete response. So this is tremendous improvement in this uh, model of colorectal cancer. The mechanism of this improvement is not understood, but there is increasing number of the studies that show um, uh, doxil, that show abraxane, and other poster child of uh, cancer nanomedicine uh, for, their, for their abilities to improve uh, outcomes of uh, the known immunotherapies. And in fact, what 
you see here is some uh, example of, of the phase one clinical trial, which investigates abroxane in combination with NJPD-1 for uh, metastatic breast cancer. Again, the science has to uh, be still established and the mechanisms of this potentiation have to be understood, but this is very interesting, very exciting uh, uh, observation. Nanoparticles uh, are increasingly used for delivery of the vaccines. Particles with a small size, uh, uh, and by small, I mean the size less than 100 nanometers, after subcutaneous or intradermal administration show uh, active trafficking into the lymph nodes, into, uh, lymph nodes into the lymphatic, and lymphatic drainage offers additional benefit for the vaccines. So here I use the uh, example, uh, uh, some of the uh, data that was recently uh, published. In this case, it was systemically administered lipoplex that carried tumor-specific RNA, and uh, uh, the study showed uh, the, that lipoplex protected RNA from degradation, so that RNA otherwise uh, is unstable. And uh, they, uh, these particles delivered RNA into antigen-presenting cells, uh, and it led to the greater production of interferon responses and induction of the stronger effector and memory T cells. Uh, I talked about the uh, uh, lymphatic delivery uh, briefly. So here I would like to use example of the study where uh, the uh, nanomaterials with the size of 25 and 100 nanometers were used, and these particles were labeled with a fluorescent tag. And so you see that after injection into the tail vein, the um, I mean, the, I'm, I'm, I apologize, no, not in the tail veil, in, in the tail, in the subcutaneous space of the tail, you see that 100 nanometer particles stayed at the site of injection, and the particles with the size 25 nanometers uh, traveled through the lymphatic and then were detected in the lymph nodes. Um, however, very often uh, the benefits of nanotechnology are also uh, come uh, along with the concerns about the safety of these materials. And here I would like to show you some of the studies showing how toxicity uh, can relocate or can change depending on the type of the nanotechnology carriers for the same drug. Again, I'm using the example of this small molecule of drug doxorubicin. It's very well studied. There are a lot of data in the literature about using this material on different types of nanotechnology platforms. Then this drug is used as a small molecule drug. It accumulates in the heart tissue. It accumulates in the bone marrow. And as a result, uh, the myelosuppression and cardiotoxicity are the main dose limiting toxicity for this material. Uh, pegylated liposomal doxorubicin, remember I told you, overcome uh, that DIC uh, type of toxicity. However, this uh, formulation now uh, results in that the drug accumulates in the skin so that cardiotoxicity and myelosuppression are decreased, especially cardiotoxicity is decreased, which is a big help for the cancer patients. However, uh, it comes with this uh, inflammatory palmar plantar erythrodysostasia, also known as a, a hand and foot syndrome. It's very painful, and patients have to be on the immunosuppressive therapy to improve the quality of their life. So uh, the cardiotoxicity is a greater concern, and it was overcome by this formulation. However, additional concern was created by reformulation of this drug. And a lot of researchers worldwide are currently working on changing or optimizing this formulation so that this toxicity is still uh, not a problem, but so that PPE uh, syndrome is uh, also uh, uh, solved. Uh, same drug uh, uh, formulated using cyanacrylate nanoparticles now was accumulated in the kidney. So all of this, this is example when all of these undesirable toxicities were resolved. However, the nephrotoxicity was the result. So the drug can relocate along with the particles, and particles may change by distribution of the drug. And uh, we need to realize it. We need to appreciate and understand that when we use variety of the nanotechnology carriers for the drug delivery. Now uh, let's shift uh, to the interaction between nanoparticles and the immune system. Uh, it's a very big area, 
And what I would like to do, I would like to focus on several aspects. So I chose the plasma proteins because I mentioned to you about the particle's ability to change drug by distribution. So how this happens, we'll talk about the plasma proteins and how they affect by distribution of the nanoparticles and their uptake by mononuclear phagocytic system. We'll talk about particle effects on erythrocytes, interaction with the blood coagulation system, and I chose various components, including platelets, leukocytes, and endothelial cells. We'll talk about allergic reactions to nanomaterials um, and uh, cytokine responses and their immunogenicity. So, uh, proteins, you know, the plasma proteome contains what, around, uh, roughly about 3,000 different types of the proteins. And albumins and globulins are the dominant proteins, but there are a lot of the other proteins in our plasma which may change uh, during physiological cycles, which may change uh, due to the level of stress, the diet that people have, the genetic diversity, and so forth. And this is very important because nanoparticles, if unless their surface is protected from, um, with uh, hydrophilic uh, uh, polymers, nanoparticles bind these proteins, and there is a bidirectional interaction between the particles and the proteins. So particles may interact with coagulation factors, uh, uh, they may uh, activate or inhibit coagulation. They may uh, bind complement proteins and result in complement activation. Uh, they uh, may <clears throat> Uh, change the conformation of the proteins that will affect the stability of the protein, the conformation of the protein, its function. On the other hand, proteins also have some effects on the particles in that the particle size may change, the biodistribution will change, the zeta potential, the, uh, it may interfere with the uh, targeting of the particles, and so forth. So here, I show you example from the book chapter wrote by uh, uh, Tommy uh, Sederval, where they use the modeling to show, depending on the particle size, so they choose the 5, 10, 25, and 50 nanometer particle, how the uh, two commonly uh, present proteins in the plasma would behave. And uh, serum albumin is uh, shown in red, so you see that as a particle size increases, there are more albumins that can uh, bind uh, to the uh, surface of this particle. Uh, this is example uh, of the protein effect on the particle physical chemical properties from the studies that my team conducted uh, several years ago. In this case, we use 13 uh, nanometer colloidal gold nanoparticles. And uh, before we in, uh, incubation with plasma, we do the hydrodyn we measure the hydrodynamic size by dynamic light scattering, and we see that the size is 33 nanometers, which is very close to their nominal size, right? But after incubation with plasma, particle size changes to 76 nanometers. That's because all of these proteins that were absor absorbed on the particle surface increase form this protein corona and increase the hydrodynamic size of the particle. So the reason why it is important is because our body will not see 30 nanometer gold. Our body will see 76 nanometer particle. And in the places where the size is important for uh, passing through uh, the uh, fenestration of, of, uh, in the um, uh, of tumor vasculature, uh, the difference between 33 and 76 nanometers may be substantial. Uh, protein binding uh, affects biodistribution. Here I show you example of the study that we co conducted in collaboration with Cytimmune Sciences. So Cytimmune product is a, a colloidal gold coated with polyethylene glycol. And uh, this is a particle uh, which is a counterpart uh, same uh, size, same composition, except that it is missing uh, polyethylene uh, glycol coating. Uh, you see that if we uh, uh, look at the protein binding, and in this case we are using two-dimensional gel electrophoresis, each of these black spots corresponds to the certain type of the blood uh, uh, protein bound to the particle surface. There are more proteins that are detected on the surface of the uncoated particle that uh, we can see on the surface of pegylated particles. So pegylation does not completely prevent protein binding, but it significantly reduce the amount of protein bound to the uh, particles. Now we look at the uptake of these particles by macrophages. While uncoated particles are readily taken up by macrophages, the pegylated particles do not. 
And then if these particles are injected in vivo, you see the color of the liver and the spleen in animals that receive just the colloidal gold. The reason why this color is black is because gold, uh, normally it has a pink color, but uh, then it is taken up by macrophages, it aggregates, and the aggregation changes uh, size, obviously, and changes color. So this is why uh, this black color basically means that the liver and spleen are loaded with the gold nanoparticles. However, then pegylated version of the same particle is, is, is injected, uh, then they stay in circulation longer. So eventually, PEG does not completely prevent uptake by the mononuclear phagocytic system, but it delays. And so while these particles stay in circulation longer, it allows them a greater time to be distributed to the uh, tumor uh, tissue uh, and deliver the drug there. Uh, there are different models of the nanoparticles uptake by the mononuclear phagocytic system. William Zamboni from University of North Carolina uh, suggested these two models. One is a capture, and the other one is hijacking. So in the capture model, particle is flowing in the bloodstream and is captured by of MPS, like tumor-resident macrophages, or uh, Kupfer cells in the liver, or uh, resident macrophages in the, in the spleen. In the hijacking model, particle is captured by the monocytes in the bloodstream, and then it is the monocyte that delivers this particle to the tumor, or liver, or spleen. Right, so you understood the uh, difference. So either particle is going to the tissue and then is captured by uh, uh, immune cells there, or immune cells do their job right there in the bloodstream, and then it's the immune cell that carries it to the tissue. It's a very interesting concept. And actually, this hijacking uh, model is uh, very actively uh, um, being explored currently for the drug delivery, especially the drug delivery to the, uh, to the brain, for the... Uh, in some uh, other location where immune cells are uh, present in the large quantity. Now let's talk about some uh, toxicities and undesirable interaction between particles and the immune cells. Hemolysis. Hemolysis is a type of toxicity that has a variety of the uh, uh, symptoms in the patients if uh, it occurs. It may be fatal depending on the degree, degree of the hemolysis, and it refers to the damage of red blood cells. Interaction between nanoparticles and red blood cells depends on the particle size, and also it depends on the particle surface charge, in that the uh, cationic particles are uh, hemolytic, while their neutral and anionic counterparts are not. And here, I would like to show you a case study using uh, PAMAM dendromeres. Uh, we used PAMAM dendromeres with various hydrodynamic size. The G refers to the generation. The greater the G number, the larger the particle is. And then we used uh, three different types of the surface coatings. And so what we observed is the small particles did not damage erythrocytes, but the, uh, the large particles did. And then if you look at the surface charge, then amine terminated the cationic particles, damaged erythrocytes, while the uh, anionic and neutral counterparts uh, did not. Coagulation system, as I mentioned, always exists in the, this balanced state between pro and anticoagulant activity. And uh, some particles may shift this balance either towards pro or anticoagulant. Again, in the state of the disease, right, if uh, there is uh, a procoagulant, if the patient is in procoagulant state, like in majority of the cancer uh, 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 patients, then the nanoparticle with anticoagulant property would be beneficial. However, uh, if there is a healthy individual in which there is a good balance between pro and anticoagulant activity and particle has anticoagulant activity, it may lead to the bleeding, right? So it's always about the balance and the shift in the balance. What we know currently from a variety of studies that uh, particles may have um, uh, various types of effects on different players of the coagulation system. Uh, particles may interact with coagulation factor and result in contact activation. They may bind and deplete coagulation factor, which results in bleeding. They may be toxic uh, to endothelial cells. They may induce uh, inflammation and oxidative stress in endothelial cells. And they also can affect platelets either by direct activation or indirect activation. 
Uh, here I would like to share with you some examples of the studies that my team conducted. Again, we are using dendrimers. Uh, you see that the small particles do not induce platelet aggregation, while their larger counterparts uh, do it as well as a say positive control. And this is the uh, scanning electron microscopy showing the particles, uh, I'm sorry, platelets in the uh, control samples and after treatment with the dendrimer. So you see that the platelets basically form these tight uh, clamps. Now, if we look at the effects of the terminal groups, we use here uh, generation six particles. So all of them have the same hydrodynamic size. They are only different by the type of the terminal groups. We see that the neutral and anionic particles do not uh, induce platelet aggregation, but their cationic counterparts do. And uh, this study was conducted in collaboration with Dr. Anil Patri, who at that time worked in, uh, at the NCL. So what, we, uh, what he did, he used uh, this uh, cationic dendrimers, and we, my team, measured the uh, platelet aggregation. Now, when they masked 25% of amines on these dendrimers, we noticed some change in the coagulation as, as they kept masking the uh, uh, surface amines, the toxicity decreased. So the zeta potential is very important. The less surface amines are available, the less platelet aggregation. This is very important for the drug delivery because uh, it is chemically, you cannot conjugate uh, drug to carboxy uh, group or to uh, hydroxyl groups. But amines are very good um, uh, surface moieties for attachment for the uh, attachment of the drugs and targeting ligands. And uh, if there are unreacted amines on the particle surface, they may result in toxicity. So the, basically the take-home message from these studies, if cationic particles are used for drug delivery, after reaction with all of the targeting moieties, with all of the drugs, any uncovered amines should be inactivated to reduce the ability of these particles to interact with erythrocytes, to interact with the platelets, to avoid hemolysis and uh, thrombogenicity. Uh, dendrimers come in different sizes, but also in, in uh, different um, uh, chemical uh, composition. So here I show you comparison between uh, triazine dendrimers and PAMAM dendrimers. Uh, we compare the particles of uh, uh, same size, and uh, what we see that for both types of the materials, the larger the particle, the greater the reactivity with platelets. However, now, if within the same size of the particle, if we look at, uh, at the uh, comparison between the triazine and PAMAM dendrimers, then we see that PAMAM dendrimers are more reactive. And if you look here at the uh, schematic of these materials, you see that at the same generation, simply because the starting uh, material uh, is uh, different, we have less number of the surface amines on the triazine dendrimers and on PAMAM dendrimers. And this is most likely the reason for why the same size of the particle, the same generation and the same surface properties, but has little different biological outcome. This study was conducted in collaboration with Dr. Eric Simonak in, uh, at Texas Christian uh, university. So now let's uh, talk about the leukocyte procoagulant activity. That's another uh, um, uh, factor that contributes to the blood coagulation. Uh, a lot of the cells that includes leukocytes, it also include cancer cells. Uh, in the resting leukocytes, do not express uh, procoagulant activity complex on the surface. But after activation with uh, some in inflammation-inducing ligands, such as bacterial lipopolysaccharide, for example, or in case of the cancer cells after treatment with cytotoxic drugs, such as doxorubicin, these cells may express so-called procoagulant activity complex, which is uh, composed of the protein tissue factor and phosphatidyl uh, uh, serine. And this uh, uh, complex serves as a platform for activation of the blood coagulation factors. Again, as a model, I'm using uh, uh, dendrimers. And as you see, as the particle um, size increases, the ability of this particle to induce procoagulant activity increases. And if you look at the effects of the surface charge, then we see the same types of the effects that uh, we observed with hemolysis and platelet aggregation, right? For the particles of the same generation, only amine-terminated particles induce this toxicity, but their uh, hydroxy and carboxy-terminated uh, counterparts do not. 
uh, nanoparticles uh, may have undesirable effects on endothelial cells. They may induce uh, inflammatory response, or they may have some direct toxicity on endothelial cells. And depending on the type of the uh, activation of the endothelial cells, it may lead to the endothelial cell dysfunction, uh, cells may die, and that will uh, result undesirable uh, side effect. Uh, Nanoparticle allergenicity is uh, another uh, uh, complex uh, area that is being actively investigated. Uh, what I would like to, the message that I would like to deliver in this presentation is that particles can be engineered to inhibit allergic responses. There are a lot of tolerogenic particles or uh, particles carry uh, uh, um, the uh, drugs that inter with uh, allergic responses. However, some particles may uh, uh, exaggerate allergy to traditional allergens and may also uh, be allergenic. Uh, this table is uh, from the recent publication by Professor Africa Gonzalez Fernandez. And uh, you see there are different types of the classical uh, allergic reactions, the type 1 immediate hypersensitivity, type 2 cytotoxic hypersensitivity, type 3 immune complex mediated hypersensitivity, and type 4 delay type hypersensitivity. And there is this pseudo allergy. So the pseudo allergy uh, is uh, a type of toxicity that uh, does not involve uh, T cells or immunoglobulins specific to allergen, but it is triggered by the activation of a complement. Another terminology for this type of reaction is carpal, complement activation related to the allergy. When it comes to nanomaterials, carpa is the best studied response to nanoparticles. And there are also limited number of reports about the uh, type 4 delay type hypersensitivity, uh, and I will show you some of the examples. I am not aware of the type 1, type 2, and type 3 of, uh, allergic responses to nanomaterials. However, in the area of environmental and occupational uh, uh, toxicology, we know that some of the nanoparticles, like carbon black particles that are present in the exhaust, in the, in the air, may exaggerate the asthma and uh, allergic responses of the already sensitized individuals. So this is an uh, example of the uh, uh, response uh, uh, to pegylated liposomal doxorubicin. This is a study, was clinical study was conducted in patients. What you see, the numbers over here refer to uh, different patients. And white bars show the baseline levels of the complement terminal complex in the plasma of these patients. Uh, the black bars show the levels of this complement terminal complex 10 minutes after administration of the pregulated liposomal doxorubicin. And you see that response varies between the donors, but many uh, donors who developed uh, type, uh, like anaphylaxis type reactions also had high levels of the complement split product. And this is type of toxicity is those limiting toxicity for pegylated liposomal doxorubicin. Now, one thing that we know about complement, that in addition to this undesirable hypersensitivity reactions in aphylaxis, complement is also very important for uh, building humoral and cellular immune response. Therefore, uh, for nanotechnology, uh, what we are um, doing, if we know that uh, particles um, are intended for systemic administration, and non-vaccine, non-immunotherapy type of reaction, then uh, anaphyla activation of complement should be avoided to avoid uh, anaphylaxis and hypersensitivity reaction. However, if particles activate complement, if we change their route of administration to subcutaneous or intradermal, they may actually benefit vaccine efficacy. And there are examples uh, in the uh, literature where uh, particles uh, which are able to activate the complement are successfully used in vaccines. Uh, this is an example of the study that shows delay type uh, hypersensitivity to nanomaterials. Uh, to my knowledge, it's only one uh, case of this necrotizing dermatitis uh, that was um, described in the literature uh, in response to dendromers. And it was actually a very interesting study. It was conducted in Japan. This student uh, reported to um, uh, uh, emergency room with fever, chills, and uh, erythema, and this fused uh, uh, bulla on his skin. 
they could not understand the mechanism, but every time this person uh, reported back to the lab, he experienced the same type of reaction. And this lab was processing large quantity of the dendromeres. It was a you know, systemic lab. No other people in the lab had the same reaction. Um, worldwide, a lot of people are using with dendromeres. So large quantities of these materials are being produced. So still, this is very interesting clinical report without well understood uh, mechanism behind it. However, the message that we learn uh, from this study is, first of all, uh, somebody has to do more investigation to understand this type of toxicity. And two, then we work with nanomaterials. It's very important to use personal protective equipment and all of the other uh, uh, measures to prevent uh, exposure, uh, undesirable inhalation or skin, skin absorption of these materials. Now let's talk about the induction of the cytokines. Before we talk about nanomaterials, I would like to use this example uh, from biotechnology products. There was a super monoclonal antibody, TGN 1412, in Europe. It's an uh, antibody that uh, specifically recognizes CD28 on the surface of the T cells. Preclinical studies were conducted in uh, non-human primates and in rodents and did not reveal cytokine storm. However, then uh, this uh, material, then this uh, antibody was used in the clinical trials. Uh, all uh, healthy uh, volunteers who participated in this, uh, in this study developed this um, uh, uh, necrosis due to the overwhelming cytokine production and specifically the overwhelming levels of the tumor necrosis factor alpha that uh, result in multiple organ failure. Many of these uh, 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 patients spend um, months in the intensive care uh, units. And uh, it took several years to understand the uh, mechanism for this toxicity. It turned out that um, this antibody induced high level of cytokines and specifically tumor necrosis factor alpha. And this type of toxicity is easily identified using uh, human peripheral blood mononuclear cells. Neither monkey nor uh, rats were able to pick up this toxicity because the epitope in CD28, which is antibody we were recognizing, was very specific to the human protein. That epitope was not present in the monkey protein and in the uh, rodent protein. So this is a very rare example. However, um, the lesson that uh, entire biotechnology community, pharmaceutical community learned from this is we still need animal studies because they help us to understand biodistribution of the drug, metabolism, and so forth. However, whenever we can substitute it with a donor uh, blood, uh, we can pick up additional toxicities and avoid uh, the problems like this one in the clinical trials. Uh, this is from uh, uh, our assay cascade. We use uh, metal oxide nanoparticles with different surface coatings. And we observe that one of these formulation uh, is uh, toxic and uh, necropsy re uh, reveals congestion and multiple organ damage similar to that seen in septic shock. However, we cannot detect endotoxin in these uh, particles. Then we use uh, these materials in vitro using human peripheral blood mononuclear cells. Then the material which was toxic in vivo also induces uh, cytokines, uh, TNF, IL-1, IL-8, uh, in vitro, and the material that was not toxic in vivo did not induce this toxicity. So in vitro studies can be used to uh, predict cytokine storm and cytokine like fever uh, mediated fever uh, uh, and fever like reactions uh, in uh, patients. The mechanism behind cytokine induction by nanomaterial is very interesting and they are uh, largely uh, not uh, very well understood, but I'll show you a couple of examples. Uh, this is uh, induction of the interleukin-8 by different types of the liposomes. We see that the liposomes that do not induce interleukin-8 do not induce oxidative stress, while materials that induce oxidative stress also induce high levels of the IL-8. And if uh, we now take this particle that highly induces interleukin-8 and we conduct the study in the presence of N-acetylcysteine, uh, which is antioxidant, then we can decrease this uh, toxicity. Another cytokine commonly reported with nanomaterials is interleukin-1, uh, and this is a publication from the literature that demonstrated that uh, different types of titanium oxide nanoparticles, depending on their shape, uh, spherical, short nanobelts, or long nanobelts, have different ability to enhance 
uh, IL-1 induction by lipopolysaccharides. So you see the spherical materials do not potentiate LPS-induced IL-1. Uh, short nanobelts a little bit potentiates, but the long nanobelts is fibrous, really long fibrous materials um, have a tremendous effect on the IL-1 production uh, in response to LPS. And the mechanism be, uh, behind it is uh, li um, linked to the particle effects on the lysosomes. Uh, a lot of cationic material uh, have, uh, the, like bendromers, for example, have this type of toxicity. Uh, the cationic materials are taken up uh, uh, by endocytosis, and then the endosome fuses with lysosome. This excess of uh, protons results in proton sponge effect, where cells basically pumps water inside of a lysosome that results in lysosomal rupture. The fibrous materials are fought to physically um, rupture the lysosome that leads to inflammasome activation. And you know that inflammasome, especially in LRP3 inflammasome, uh, is an uh, enzymatic uh, a protein complex that it is needed to cleave uh, a precursor of IL-1 protein and release mature IL-1. Um, now, to understand the carriers, this is an example of the cytokine induction with cationic liposome. You see they are highly pro-inflammatory. Uh, they induce cytokines, chemokines, metalloproteinases, which are uh, known as a danger signal. This induction is uh, related to the oxidative stress. But uh, the reason why I would like to show this is then particle-induced cytokines, it's not good for drug delivery for systemic administration of these materials. However, it can benefit vaccines, right? There is always a, uh, uh, you know, uh, this toxicity could be bad or good depending on whether it is desirable or not. So these cationic liposomes that are extremely pro-inflammatory are in fact used in, uh, currently it's, it's, I believe it's in phase two clinical trials where uh, these materials are used for uh, vaccine and they are not in injected systemically, but they injected uh, subcutaneously. Um, it is very important to understand the pro inflammatory properties of the drugs or active pharmaceutical ingredients that are delivered using nanoparticles. In this case, I'm using as example, I'm using the uh, single guided um, RNA uh, contract, uh, constructs from this CRISPR-Cas9 uh, system just to show you some structure activity relationship. You see that the RNA-based uh, materials are more pro-inflammatory uh, than uh, uh, DNA-based uh, uh, materials. And as a sign of inflammation, I'm using levels uh, of the type 1 interferon, interferon alpha. Uh, if uh, the same sequence of the materials are modified with 2 prime oxymethyl and the changing of the backbone from the phosphodiester to phosphorothiate, that this inflammatory activity can be completely eliminated. Uh, if uh, uh, these uh, uh, single-guided RNAs are prepared by in vitro transcription, they induce uh, uh, interferons. However, uh, removal of the 5 prime triphosphate reduces ability to induce interferons. And then finally, the origin, whether it is in vitro transcribed or uh, uh, and then annealed, or whether it is uh, uh, generated uh, through the chemical synthesis and then annealed, it doesn't make uh, any uh, difference. But why we are looking at the in, uh, information about the carrier and about the API? Because if these properties, if the inflammatory properties are overlapping, right, then it would be no goal for systemic administration. If, however, we, use, we want to use vaccine or immunotherapies and we consider alternative route of administration, then this overlapping properties will become beneficial. In other words, if I use cationic liposome, which I showed you on the previous slide, which is highly pro-inflammatory, and I combine it with this uh, interferon-inducing single-guided RNA, right, what I would, we would expect? We would expect a greater inflammation with that final formulation. Uh, in vaccine, it may be good, but for systemic administration, it is no go. Uh, and finally, immunogenicity. Immunogenicity, in a way, how it, uh, in, in its normal uh, definition, refers uh, to the building of the immunity and specific immune response uh, that includes uh, uh, the humoral immune response and antibody generation. What we know from many years of the research is that nanoparticles themselves are not immunogenic. So one cannot generate antibodies to nanoparticles 
unless you conjugate them to a protein carrier. So nanoparticles behave as a haptin. And in the literature, there are examples of this uh, uh, antibodies that were generated uh, to C60, C70 fullerenes, to carbon uh, nanotubes, and uh, uh, dendromeres and liposomes after the conjugation of the, to the protein, or in the case of the liposome, uh, it was uh, the, the liposomes carried TLR uh, ligand. But there are no examples uh, in the literature, there are no reports where the engineered nanomaterial that uh, was carrying therapeutic proteins would result in either nanoparticle specific or the drug specific immune response. No other, there are examples uh, of uh, the nanotechnology formulated proteins uh, which uh, decreased the immunogenicity of the protein. And some of the examples include the spigulated uh, gold uh, TNF, site 6091 and also liposomal streptokinase and liposomal uh, factor eight. However, this is a problem area in uh, biotechnology therapeutics. Some of the accidental, undesirable nano-sized materials that include, include glass fibers, cellulose fibers, tungsten, silicon oil, rubber, stainless steel, fluoropolymers that uh, may leach and may be introduced into the recombinant protein formulations during manufacturing and this particle promote aggregation of these therapeutic proteins and contribute to uh, the immunogenicity. So the take home message is that particles may be immunogenic. Uh, they also may in, uh, reduce immunogenicity of therapeutic proteins, but most importantly, uh, we need to distinguish the particles that are designed for a drug delivery from this accidental nanomaterials, right? Because accidental nanomaterials are the troublemakers. The engineered nanoparticles can be engineered to avoid immunogenicity if it is undesirable. So my take home message from this presentation is that immunotoxicity of nanoparticles can be good or bad. It really depends on whether this toxicity is desirable or undesirable. And uh, we, the benefit of nanotechnology is in the ability to engineer the particle physical chemical properties to improve their desirable biological outcomes and reduce undesirable ones. And also it is very, for this same reason, it is very important to understand structure activity relationship and the mechanism of toxicity. Why? Because once we understand it, we can um, select the carrier for uh, which would be the most optimal for the certain type of drug for the certain indication. Uh, with this, I would like to thank uh, all of my colleagues at the Nanotechnology Characterization Lab, and specifically the uh, thank you to uh, my team members, both uh, current and the past, and uh, thank you all for your attention. You know what, this is a wonderful question. So the question was, uh, are the nanoparticles eventually clear from the body or they accumulate in the liver or spleen? It depends on the type of the particle. So for, uh, remember then I showed this uh, FDA uh, uh, publication with the type, with the dominant type of nanomaterials used for drug delivery. Most of them are what? lipids, liposomes, and emulsions. So these are biodegradable materials. They come, they do their job, then they are degraded, they do not stay. But if we talk about carbon nanotubes, if we talk about colloidal gold, for example, these materials are durable. So they, after they lose all of their coating, they eventually accumulate in the uh, mononuclear phagocytic system. And there are studies that show that these metallic particles can stay in the body for a very long time. And the idea behind it is, you know, the Kupfer cells capture the particles and then uh, then the Kupfer cell dies, it releases the particle, and then the new Kupfer cell comes and, you know, you know take it up. And so this process continues. Um, however, and, and, and I, think, I think that this is the reason why carbon nanotubes, uh, you know, this, uh, very durable materials are not um, uh, uh, popular materials for drug delivery. However, when it comes to colloidal gold, colloidal gold was used for the uh, therapy of arthritis for many, many years. So even though it accumulates in the immune cells, there are no described toxicity for these types of materials. And if you want a fan fact, uh, there is a, um, you know, if you email me, I'll send you the link. It's a, 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 a doctor of science thesis, like dissertation. 
uh, from Denmark, uh, published in 1962. So what this person did, he uh, studied clearance of the gold nanoparticles in mice, and he also used his students. And so if you look at the, you know, 1962, I guess the ethical regulations were not so strict as we have now. Um, I commonly ask like some of my colleagues at the FDA and this regulatory of authorities, maybe it's now a very good time to follow up, find all of these patients, all of these students, because their names are identified in the dissertation. Now we do our studies blind, but back then there was no blind studies. And follow up, do they have any, you know, health issues or, you know, how that injection of the gold influenced um, their uh, health? So, but no, no one has done the study. It's just an interesting dissertation that I found looking at the clearance of the colloidal gold. Yeah, so it's uh, very good. The, the question is, uh, we, I used a lot of examples of doxorubicin, but are there other chemotherapeutics? So paclitaxel is another drug, and you know that abraxane is a nanoalbumin particle uh, uh, that is a nanotechnology counterpart to taxol. In taxol, the paclitaxel is delivered using crema for al which is nano-sized emulsion, but it's basically, it's not used to... Um, deliver the drugs, but it used to formulate it, and crema 4 uh, is associated with a lot of the complement activation mediated toxicities. So another formulation approved for clinical use is uh, onilide, that's a liposomal formulation of arena t can. Um, so that is, uh, and, and there is a downosome, which is downorubicin, um, so that's, you know, pretty much that, and like doxorubicin, downorubicin, paclitaxel, and uh, arena t can. Yeah, because it's always risk versus benefit, and, and this is how FDA approves the drug. If the uh, benefit outweighs the risk, then formulations are approved. But I think what I'm uh, uh, optimistic is as we learn more about the mechanisms, about the properties of the particles that are responsible for certain types of toxicity, the hope exists that we can find a way to develop the formulation so that the therapeutic benefit will still be there, but toxicities will be eliminated. Absolutely. That's the goal. The most important thing. Yeah. <laughs>